Hello everyone, this is Dr. Madhusudan Rao and the program I teach medical students. Today in my lesson I am going to touch briefly on the most interesting topic that is rheumatic fever. What is rheumatic fever? Rheumatic fever is the non-suppurative complication of streptococcal pharyngitis. It is nearly two-thirds of the patients who present with the rheumatic fever, they give history of streptococcal infection of throat, that is streptococcal pharyngitis. Well, the prevalence of the rheumatic fever correlates with the age and seasonal incidence of streptococcal infection. Besides, if you look at the serological and microbiological evidence of streptococcal infection in the patients presenting with rheumatic fever. Then outbreaks of streptococcal infection also correlate with the prevalence of rheumatic fever. Well, when you give, treat the streptococcal pharyngitis adequately and provide the prophylaxis Incidence of rheumatic fever and its recurrence has come down. This all shows the relationship between the streptococcal pharyngitis and the occurrence of rheumatic fever in the population. Nearly it accounts about 50% of the acquired heart diseases. It is too high. In a community where the streptococcal pharyngitis is common, the occurrence of chronic rheumatic heart diseases is to the extent of 50% of those who got infected with the streptococcus. So the very idea of learning about the Rheumatic fever lies in understanding the consequences of rheumatic heart disease as a sequel to rheumatic fever. Okay. Well, if you provide the adequate prophylaxis for the streptococcal infection, the incidence of rheumatic heart disease and thereby the chronic rheumatic heart diseases can be curtailed. Well, so we have got to learn more about the rheumatic fever, its etiopathogenesis, clinical presentation, and uh, treatment and prophylaxis. Well, It is the mucoid stains of group A beta hemolytic streptococci. M0 types of 1, 3, 5, 6, 8, 18, and 24 are more commonly associated with rheumatic fever. Okay. If the patient suffers from acute streptococcal pharyngitis caused by these particular strains of beta hemolytic streptococci, okay, they are likely to develop rheumatic fever if they were not treated adequately. Okay, how it is going to happen? We are going to look into the pathogenesis. The Individuals between the 5 to 15 years of age are at risk with genetic background, especially HLAD 18 and 17. Environmental factors do play in the occurrence of rheumatic fever because circulating streptococcal strains during 
say winter months, they run in parallel to the occurrence of rheumatic fever in this in that particular community. Overcrowding associated with the increased prevalence of cross infections that again results in the incidence of rheumatic fever. And medical facilities, if the medical facilities are poor in order to curtail the streptococcal infection and its prevalence through appropriate treatment, there is going to be increased prevalence of rheumatic fever in that particular community. Then having known the occurrence of rheumatic fever hand in hand with the prevalence of streptococcal pharyngitis, let us understand the pathogenesis of the this particular condition. Why streptococcal infection of the throat results in the occurrence of disease involving the organ center site far away from the site of infection. That means individual suffers throat infection caused by the streptococci and following two to three weeks he suffers with rheumatic fever where the organs affected are far away from the site of primary throat infection. That is, patients suffered from acute pharyngitis as a complication to this suffers from rheumatic fever wherein there is involvement of joint, brain and heart. Why should it occur? The mechanism is not clearly known but they propose two, two theories that is one is cytotoxic theory another one is the immunological theory. Cytotoxic theory says streptococci they release enzymes and the toxins which are toxic to the tissues. For example, streptolysin O produced by the streptococci is toxic to the myocardium tissues in the joint and brain cells. Well, but long latent period between the onset of infection and occurrence of rheumatic fever cannot explain the cytotoxic theory. Coming to the immunological theory, it is said there is cross-reacting antibodies due to molecular mimicry that is responsible for the tissue damage. Okay. Say when the collagen is coated by the uh, say M protein that is streptococcal antigen. The antibodies are produced like against this collagen resulting in the immunological damage. Yes, this hypothesis has been accepted for rheumatic fever because there is a raise in antibody titer that is anti-streptolysin O and other antibodies anti-hyaluronidase, anti-DNA, AHB, etc which are going to cross-react with uh, the tissues of the joint or the heart or the brain resulting in the manifestations of rheumatic fever. Well, 
क्लिनिकल फीचर्स द क्लिनिकल फीचर्स एंड द डायग्नोसिस ऑफ रोमैटिक फीवर बेस्ड ऑन द क्लिनिकल फीचर्स to avoid the more diagnosis or under diagnosis it was uh, t ducket jones in 1944 proposed some criteria for the diagnosis of rheumatic fever at the same time in order to avoid over diagnosis or the under, or under diagnosis of this particular condition <coughs> subsequently in 1992 American Heart Association, they modified the criteria. But one important point to remember is, in spite of the fact we strictly follow the Jones criteria, there is always chances of over diagnosis or under diagnosis of rheumatic fever. So this is very important for the students to remember these criteria. and apply to the patient in order to diagnose and treat appropriately the rheumatic fever so there are four major five major criteria and four minor criteria and then essential criteria combination of two major and essential one essential criteria that is essential criteria combination of one major two minor and essential criteria we can come to the conclusion of rheumatic fever what are these criteria but those criteria are laid down in order to diagnose initial episode of rheumatic fever but there are certain exceptions for jones criteria when the child presents with isolated chorea okay you can directly say it is a case of rheumatic fever without applying jones criteria okay in the same way indolent carditis when the patient presents with indolent carditis A diagnosis of rheumatic fever can be made directly without considering the Jones criteria. In the same way, recurrent rheumatic fever, there is no need to apply the Jones criteria. So these are the three conditions situations where rheumatic fever diagnosis does not require Jones criteria. That is isolated chorea. indolent carditis and recurrent rheumatic fever so what are the major criteria number 1 migratory polyarthritis remember migratory polyarthritis wherein large joints are involved they are painful extremely pain painful associated with swelling the pain the patient experiences is so intense that he cannot bear the weight of the blanket that is the situation well this particular situation lasts for 1 to 3 days and joint improves spontaneously and the symptoms appears in the in other joints this is the called the migratory polyarthritis they respond dramatically to salicylates okay after recovery there is no residual damage to the joint at all okay severity of the arthritis is inversely related to that of carditis okay that's the reason you you welcome arthritis to carditis so and when you examine the synovial fluid 
its cellularity will range from 10000 to 100000 predominantly polymorphs with uh, the protein more than 4 grams and sugar being normal so it is not bacterial infection in the that is pyogenic uh, arthritis the fluid will be having low glucose and compared to normal glucose in this case and culture shows the presence of bacterial infection well patients present with uh, migratory polyarthritis in nearly 70% of the cases of rheumatic fever 75% okay they are migratory also is the pain and swelling leaves no residual damage responds very well to salicylates okay and affects nearly 75% of the patients with rheumatic fever joint severity is inversely related to the severity of cardiac these are the points to remember spontaneous results results in 1 to 3 days only to re- reappear in other joints so this how the classical migratory polyarthritis of rheumatic fever presents to you so that's why clear history is very important to diagnose rheumatic arthritis coming to cardiitis affects nearly 50 to 55% of the patients with rheumatic fever it is pan cardiitis involving the pericardium myocardium and endocardium myocarditis and pericarditis without endocarditis it is not rheumatic cardiitis okay there should be clinical evidence of endocarditis or valvulitis just mere echocardiography findings of endocarditis does not fit the jones criteria okay cardiitis could be mild moderate severe or fulminant fulminant pan cardiitis may lead to mortality and uh, if there is cardiitis in the initial episode subsequent episode patient will develop cardiitis okay if the child do not have cardiitis in the initial episode of rheumatic fever it is unlikely they develop cardiitis in the subsequent attacks okay this about rheumatic cardiitis well endocarditis involves the mitral followed by aortic valves next chorea it involves 10 to 15% of the patients with rheumatic fever it is isolated manifestation associated with emotional ability in coordination poor school performance and it will have long latent period following streptococcal pharyngitis there is milk made grip one minute darting movement of the tongue when he is asked to protrude the tongue spooning and pronation of the palm disturbed handwriting okay there is no permanent damage to the brain cells following recovery okay then erythema marginatum it is a rare manifestation of rheumatic fever affects nearly less than 3% of the patients the lesion is macular erythematous non prorotic okay there is a macular lesion with central pallor occur predominantly over the trunk and extremities face is pale okay and if you warm the area the lesion will be extensive it 
coming to subcutaneous nodules. It occurs in less than 1% of the patients with rheumatic fever, about 1 cm in diameter, firm in consistency to feel, and more so seen on the extensor and bony prominences. Subcutaneous nodules correlates with severity of carditis. Remember this point. This is the X-ray of the chest in the patient with rheumatic pancarditis presenting in congestive heart failure. Okay. He took steroid treatment and the wonderful response. This X-ray is taken following treatment. And these are certain of the echocardiographic tracings of the patients with acute rheumatic fever showing the mitral volulitis with the narrowing of idiomatis, mitral leaflets resulting in narrowing, and there is a, a sort of regurgitant jet from the left atrium into the, I mean left ventricle into the left atrium because of the incompetence of the idiomatis dilated valvular ring. It occurs in the early rheumatic volulitis associated with myocarditis. There is a dilatation of the ventricular wall, a ventricular chamber, dilatation of the mitral ring that results in the incompetence of the mitral wall. This condition usually improves with treatment when treated with steroids, there is tremendous improvement of this particular situation. That is, mitral regurgitation occurring in acute rheumatic fever improves very well with steroids. We have seen a lot of cases. Our cases, they do improve with following treatment with steroids. Again, this is uh, the mitral volulitis, idiomatis, I mean, uh, left ventricular, wall, secondary to myocarditis. That is usually pancarditis that results in uh, the idiom of the ring as well as the myocardium. This again shows thickening idiomatis, mitral wall leaflets. Okay. You see, in this particular patient, in this echocardiogram, there is left atrial thrombus formation. Yeah. This is the patient with chronic rheumatic mitral valve disease showing fusion of the leaflets, sclerose thickened valve apparatus resulting in severe mitral stenosis. These are the visitations which form around the ring and other tissues of the valve healed by fibrosis causing the deformity and destruction of the volvular anatomy. This again, there are very key around the margins of the leaflets of the mantle valve. This is anterior and this is posterior and fusion of the commissures. So the valve is deformed with fish mouth appearance. It's a child with chronic rheumatic mitral valve disease resulting in stenosis. This is the picture showing the subcutaneous nodules or the bony prominence. You see the erythema marginatum. Lesions are seen over the back. Flat and erythematous. 
This is the Erdema marginatum. Well, these are the, the major criteria of rheumatic fever. Coming to minor criteria, these include two clinical and two laboratory criteria. What are the clinical criteria? One is arthralgia, two, fever. Laboratory criteria, elevated acute phase reactants, that is ESR or CRP, and prolonged PR interval is the other laboratory criteria. Essential criteria being proof of evidence of previous streptococcal throat infection. Evident by the rise in the anti-streptolysin votator, which is commonly occurs in a child with rheumatic fever when compared to the rest of the people in the community. And 10 to 15 percent show positive streptococcal culture. Okay, very less. 10 to 15 percent is not going to be that helpful. But the antibody titer is relatively very high in the patients who suffer from acute rheumatic fever, so much so acute rheumatic carditis. Then coming to the differential diagnosis. Sometimes it is situations very confusing. And uh, the arthritis manifestations are typical. So we may be confused with rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lobus erythematosus, malignancies, sickle cell disease with arthritis, joint pains, serum sickness, well, or reactive arthritis. So we have to carefully evaluate the patient who presents with the features of rheumatic fever in order to diagnose appropriately, avoid over-treatment or neglect the case with under-treatment, okay. which is again a problematic and child may go into chronic rheumatic heart disease unless treated appropriately. Then coming to the treatment, how do you treat the case of acute rheumatic fever? Provide bed rest. Give antibiotics, give anti inflammatory therapy in the form of salicylates or steroids. Bed rest. Then there are severe manifestations of acute carditis, then only provide rest. Otherwise, you can ambulate the patient. To suit his well being, degree of well being. But the bed rest should be prolonged for the patient with fulminant or moderately severe carditis. The antibiotics have to be given in order to curtail the streptococcal infection, thereby reducing the antigenemia. Give penicillin for 10 days or one shot of benzene penicillin 12 wax. If the patient is hypersensitive to penicillin, give erythromycin for 10 days. Then anti-inflammatory therapy. Your salicylates, your steroids. Salicylates They improve polyarthritis and arthritis will, as I told you, respond dramatically with salicylates. If the patient is, has presented with only arthritis, no evidence of arthritis, go by salicylates. That is 10 mg per kg per day, orally, 4 divided doses. Give for three to five days. 
then torn down the doors to 75 mg per kg per day orally for four doses continue for four days that is the course of steroids for rheumatic fever with polyarthritis and steroids are indicated for cardiitis as well as the cardiomegaly and the congestive heart failure give prednisolone 2 mg per kg body weight four divided doses for 2 to 3 days okay then taper it at a rate of 5 mg per day every 2 to 3 days okay start salicylates at the beginning of tapering continue 75 mg per kg per day in four divided doses for 6 weeks so this is the the plan of treatment with regard to salicylates and steroids provide support to care treat chm salt re- restriction diuretics and digoxin treat chorea with phenobarbital or haloperidol 0.01 to 0.03 mg per kg per day in two divided doses they do very well respond give the nutritious diet give the emotional support okay the improvement with regard to medical management of acute rheumatic fever is excellent even endocarditis resulting with presenting with the mitral regurgitation they do improve dramatically following steroid therapy see with the above plan of treatment nearly 70% recover without residual heart disease okay complete at the time of finish examination of the patient with acute rheumatic fever and cardiitis said is primary initial episode you have examined the heart there is pan systolic murmur at the mitral area radiating to axilla you think it is a case of mitral regurgitation of acute mitral valvulitis okay well there is mid diastolic murmur probably carry combs murmur that is because of the narrowing of the mitral wall secondary to the edema these clinical signs improve dramatically following steroid therapy okay for those cases you should provide the secondary prophylaxis in the form of benzodiazepine benzodiazepine you are going to help the patient for the recurrent cardiitis rheumatic cardiitis thereby prevent chronic rheumatic heart disease to develop okay well no cardiitis during initial episode unlikely the patient develops cardiitis in subsequent attack of rheumatic fever if the patient suffers cardiitis in the initial episode of rheumatic fever he is likely to develop cardiitis in the subsequent episode of rheumatic fever there lies the importance of secondary prophylaxis for rheumatic fever if you prevent streptococcal pharyngitis the recurrence of the rheumatic fever can be avoided prevented thereby rheumatic cardiitis okay this is the importance of providing secondary prophylaxis for rheumatic fever well we have seen a, the patient with pure chorea you said it is a case of rheumatic chorea if you left them without rheumatic prophylaxis 20% of these children are going to develop chronic rheumatic heart disease 
okay so please keep it in mind children presenting with isolated chorea provide long term prophylaxis in order to protect them from rheumatic heart disease then prevention it is a prevent preventable disease provide pre- primary prophylaxis in the form of treating the streptococcal pharyngitis adequately with the antibiotics that is penicillin for 10 days or erythromycin for 10 days or single shot of benzodiazepine then provide secondary prophylaxis okay secondary prophylaxis in the form of benzodiazepine penicillin every 3 weeks to 4 weeks one shot continue for a period of 5 years following the initial attack or up to the age of 20 years or lifetime if the patient had rheumatic carditis following which you have to provide the penicillin prophylaxis for lifetime or or for 20 years if the patient did not suffer from carditis during the initial episode of rheumatic fever provide secondary prophylaxis for 5 years following the last episode of rheumatic fever this is the plan of treatment with regard to rheumatic fever and prophylaxis in terms of primary prophylaxis or secondary prophylaxis this how it is secondary prophylaxis carditis in initial episode provide anti- antibiotic prophylaxis into adulthood or lifetime without carditis antibiotics till early 20s or for 5 years from the last episode the drug given is benzodiazepine penicillin 12 lakhs units single im once in 3 to 4 weeks or erythromycin for patients with penicillin allergy well this how you have got to identify rheumatic fever and treat the acute episode in a proper prevent the long term prophylaxis in order to avoid recurrences avoid chronic heart rheumatic heart disease so thereby you are helping the family as well as the patient with regard to morbidity and mortality and health care expenditure it is really a preventable disease with regard to the rheumatic chronic chronic rheumatic heart disease if not it is going to incur a lot of expenditure for the health care and patient is going to suffer for long years secondary to the chronic rheumatic heart disease okay please take care of the children with who presents with the acute rheumatic fever counsel them adequately provide them long term prophylaxis okay thank you very much for patient listening we'll meet you again in the next class until that time goodbye bye bye